Hey everyone, welcome back to a new r slash malicious compliance video. I hope you had a great day. The first story is called Jury Duty. This was back in the 80s. My first job, working as a maintenance man at a local hotel. I'd been working there part time since I was 16 and when I turned 18 I got a notice to attend jury duty. I picked a week and I let my boss know. The owner of the hotel found out. He was always a completely unreasonable jerk to all the employees. He sees me in the hallway and tells me that I need to do whatever it takes to get out of jury duty because he needs me at the hotel that week for a large dog show, clock drains and such. And if I'm not at work, I'm fired. When I get to jury duty day one, I get selected to a week long trial and the judge asks jurors if there's any reason we cannot serve on the jury. They go around and when they get to me, I tell the judge that the owner of the business I work at will fire me if I'm not back today. And that he said I needed to do everything I can to get out of jury duty or I won't have a job. Other than that, I'm fine serving. The judge looks super mad. The judge has me approach the bench and ask for the name of the owner, location and such. Then he hands the court officer a paper and says something to the officer. The judge still looks really angry. I'm told to return to the jury box. About an hour later, still selecting a jury, the officer returns with the owner, visibly shaken, in handcuffs and walk to the front of the judge's bench. The owner is standing in front of the judge. The judge asks him questions, which he apologetically tries to warm out of. Then the judge, looking even angrier, instructs him that I will be here for jury duty. I will serve as long as I need to and he should not do anything to retaliate against me. And that the judge is filing charges and will be instructing the clerk to check with me regularly. And if for any reason I am fired or face any disciplinary action at work, he will hold the owner in contempt, violation of a court order and a bunch of other legal stuff. And he will spend time behind bars thinking about how important jury duty is. Then the judge makes him apologize to me in court. I made it onto the jury and I served a week. I reported back to work the following week. I expected some blowback, but I never got fired, none of my shifts were changed and I got paid for my time in jury. The clerk did check back a few times and I was told to call the judge's clerk's direct phone number if anything happened. It was awesome, I was pretty much bulletproof and worked until I saved enough to go back to school. The next story is called All Sales Are Final. My wedding budget was slim. My now husband and I paid for it all out of savings and took every opportunity to cut costs. So when it came to the dress, I decided to purchase it from a small consignment boutique. They post their inventory online and I watched it for weeks to find the right dress, my style, my size and a good price. Finally the day came and my dream dress pops up on the side. I drive in, try it on and love it. I swiped my credit card and left the store happy with my purchase. My credit card statement came a week later and I noticed that the $500 charge wasn't on it. I just assumed that it had missed the cutoff and would be on the next bill. A month later, still no charge. So I called my credit card company to inquire. They said they never saw a charge from this company come through nor had there been any charges for that amount in the last two months. I checked the receipt, it specifically said discover ending in with my last 4 digits so I knew it had to have been this card. The best they could guess is that there was some sort of glitch and the charge never ran through. So I call up the boutique, give my name and have the following conversation. I bought a dress about 6 weeks ago. Cutting me off, the store employee said, all sales are final, we don't do refunds or exchanges. No, I love the dress, I'm not looking to return it. I just noticed that there's no charge on my credit card statement. That's your problem, not ours. You bought the dress, you figure it out. No, you don't understand. I have the receipt that shows the price of $500, but... I was cut off again, we don't adjust prices after the purchase. You should have thought about the price before you swiped your card. There's nothing we can do for you. So I told them I was sorry to have bothered them and hung up. The third story is called My Hero. I've worked in bars for years and I worked with this guy who was always on it. Super smart, never lost for words, very funny and generally one of the most professional bartenders I've worked with. 
This was an exceptional night. We worked two tour station on really busy nights, so I had a front row seat to this jam. This greasy douchebag is waiting in front of our station with his elbow on the bar not facing us. Getting a little annoyed that he is blocking people getting served, Sam taps him on the arm. Hey man, you want anything? He said, in a sec mate, as he shoes him off and continues squeezing on this drunk girl. Starting to change his attitude, Sam grips back. You are blocking people from the bar man. Take your dump or get off the pot. At this point I start to slow down. Where is this going? The greasy douche face grows up and looks Sam up and down. Give me a coke, he barks with no manners. Sam whips a glass behind his back and catches it in his left hand. Ice in the glass, glass on the bar and throws a straw in the air as he pours coke from the soda gun. 250, thanks, as Sam spins around and enters it into the till. The douche is staring at the drink. What is this? A coke, as you asked, Sam said with impatience and vex. That is not what I asked for, he responded. If I wanted ice, I would have asked for ice, pushing the glass back at Sam. Sam picks up the glass with both hands and did something that I was not expecting. He apologized. You are so right. I am so sorry. How stupid of me. Let me fix that for you. Sam grabs the soda gun and pours coke all over the bar counter. The douche jerks his arm away, not because he notices it, but because his shirt is getting wet. His anger palpable. If you wanted a glass, you would have asked for one. Sam spouts as he throws a straw in the puddle, turns his back, walks off and flips the bird. My hero. The last story is called Wood Cause. This happened several years ago. The event occurred at an establishment near a US military base. We were at a bar, it was just four of us. A black gentleman who shall be known as Taylor, me, call me Luther, my friend Mick and a giant jerk called Bubba. We were sharing song requests. Baba decided to start singing the N-word, but it's not even like he was saying the N-word along with the lyrics. He was just bobbing his head back and forth, going and that, and this, and you, and everything, blah blah. Obviously, this was uncalled for, and he was told to hush. Now, Mick and I are both right, but Mick has a biracial son and daughter, and just recently his son was bullied for his skin color at school. So this was a touchy subject for Mick. Taylor also jumped into the conversation, basically trying to explain to Bubba that this just ain't cool. I pull Bubba aside and recognize it's the liquor talking. We have a conversation on why the n-word is not okay, especially in a taunting manner like he is using, and he should apologize by everyone around and we keep it moving. Apparently Bubba took this to mean we were violating his first amendment rights. This enraged him even more and he went on a speech about how if a black man can say the n-word, so should he and this is America and we should all be equal. Well, Mick got into his face and it was getting super heated. I don't think Boba understood how much of a problem this was. I pulled Boba aside and basically said he's touching a hot button because his biracial son was recently bullied for being black. At which point Baba decided it would be an excellent idea to tell Mick things you should never ever say. At this point, Taylor and I had zero interest in stopping what came next. Before I move forward, Baba is an overweight man in his 50s whose hobbies included drinking beer and eating steak. Mick was an active duty soldier whose hobbies included weightlifting and boxing. At no point was anyone in that establishment under the misguided belief that this fight would be even remotely close. However, at least in my mind, I knew it would be a short fight. Honestly, calling this a fight is dishonest. Mick walked over to Bubba and said, I'm only going to say this one, apologize and leave. To which Bubba stood up, proud and said, screw you. I don't think Bubba saw the punch coming, but he sure did feel it. Bubba went straight down like a lock. Baba was dazed and I'm sitting there wondering how bad will this end for him as I sipped on my beer. Mick said some words, went to the bar, paid his tab and left. Taylor paid his tab and left too. Baba was still on the floor, he was awake and I think he was kinda shocked. I walk over to Baba and asked him if he's okay. He asked if I can help him up and I told him he got himself on the floor, he can find a way up of it. Boba gets up, comes to the bar and goes and reporting Mick to his command. 
I advise Boba should think long and hard before reporting Mick to his command, cause it may not end up as he expected to. Did I mention Baba was a contractor on the local military base? He was a mechanic that worked on heavy equipment, a very replaceable position. Boba asked me if I would be his witness if he decided to report the incident. I told Boba I'd be a witness and I'd tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth and I meant it. Well, a few days after the incident, I was also a contractor on the base, I get a call from the MPs asking me if I'd be willing to make a statement on what happened and I said I would. I went down to the provost marshal's office and I made my statement and I mentioned everything. Afterward, I called Mick and asked him what was going on on his head. He said that Boba had reported it and he's being investigated for assault. I asked Mick what he told the MPs. He said he told him the truth, he punched the guy for being racist, insulting his family and his son. He also said he reported it to his commander. Yes, Mick reported the fact that he punched Boba to his commander. Mick also said that Taylor also made similar statements. I then get called in again, but this time to the base commander's office. As I'm waiting for my time, Taylor walks out. I asked Taylor what he said and Taylor said everything. I nodded, it was like we were in this together. I sit down with the commander who is going over my statement. Actually, very little was actually said about Mick punching Bubba. The commander asked me if I had anything else to add and I said I'm impressed he only got punched once. A few days later I'm talking to Mick and he tells me he had ended up getting an article 15 with a very light punishment, no reduction in pay or rank. The message he got was to take the article 15, move forward, you'll be fine. Bova on the other hand got bad from the base. As a result, the company he was working for fired him with cause since he couldn't get access to the base. This would mean no unemployment benefits for Boba. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have a great day, stay safe, bye bye.